Hi everyone, my name is Anastasia Lapatina and you're watching This Week in Ukraine, a video podcast from the Kyiv Independent. Every week, I sit down with one of my newsroom colleagues to dive into Ukraine's most pressing issues. And this time, we're talking about the destruction of the Kahovka Dam in Kherson Oblast, arguably one of the worst breaches of the Geneva Conventions in recent decades. I'm joined by the Kyiv Independent reporter Igor Kwasov. Igor, welcome back to the show. Thanks. So I want to begin by talking about how much do we know about what actually happened and how did we learn about it? People started reporting explosions at night. At the crack of dawn, there were images of a giant gap in what was once an intact dam. It became clearer to both the Ukrainian government and to experts um, who were interviewed by, such as by the New York Times, for example, that the explosion was caused uh, with demolition charges placed inside the structure and not by an outside weapon. The engine room was taken out by the explosion, and there is a gap of, I believe, over 100 meters. A Russian blogger said that 11 out of 28 uh, segments or gates uh, were taken out. So it's it's a pretty much a total write-off. So it can't be repaired. It can only be rebuilt. And how many people were in direct danger and still are in direct danger because of this destruction? The Kherson Regional Military Administration said something like 16,000 people were in a direct path of the flood zone with about um, 80 populated areas um, threatened directly by the floods. But hundreds of thousands of people will be affected in some way by this. Um, the dozens of villages were flooded. Um, there were a couple of towns that we looked at, uh, Oleshki and uh, Hola Pristan. They had water like right up to the roofs. You could see people sitting on the rooftops and the water just kind of lapping mm -hmm. shortly, like a little bit under it. We see um, boats floating past just the tops of trees poking out of the water. We've heard about the first drowning deaths uh, yesterday and uh, lots of people were trapped, on, unable to go anywhere if they don't have a boat and nobody can come to them in a boat. Uh, when the news first broke, uh, people obviously tried to get out of the flood zone, but the Russians were turning people back. We heard multiple accounts of Russians actually stopping people, sometimes even firing into the air or uh, throwing grenades to drive people back uh, for whatever reason they didn't explain. That's uh, an occupied territory of Kyrgyzstan Oblast, right? Exactly. That's uh, the, um, see, the, the, the eastern bank, um, also called the left bank, is... Uh, a little bit lower than the other one, so the flood water hit that side the hardest. So in occupied territories, yeah, we heard that Russians actually kept people penned in in the flood zone and that they actually even removed or um, destroyed boats in some, in some areas, uh, people told us. In uh, liberated territories, um, there was evacuation. I mean, like, uh, believe close to 1,800 people were uh, take, uh, brought out shelters being set up and all that, uh, or they're take, taken in by someone they know. So many international media outlets took their very usual route and reported on the dam destruction as something that Ukraine accused Russia of, mm -hmm. as if the mm -hmm. fact that Russia was behind it was unconfirmed and maybe at the end of the day it was Ukraine or maybe Mother Nature was behind it. Uh, the Ukrainian media reported on it totally differently. Because there are several things that actually happened in the past that make it quite clear that Russia is behind this. So tell us about those things. Yeah, I could see why they reported like that. But they've been way, way too cautious and kid love in the past about things that Russia has done. So that's provoked some kind of a, a little bit of uh, misgivings among some Ukrainian reporters who know better. Starting with the dam itself, we've known that Russia has mined it since about October. And uh, that's been a looming threat. Uh, kind of a sort of Damocles uh, hanging over the area for since then. Prime Minister Denis Shmihal called for an international monitoring mission to find out what happened. Uh, the National Security Council's uh, head, um, Danilov, uh, said that uh, it was actually Russia's 205th uh, motorized rifle brigade that uh, conducted the demolition. Russia has consistently attacked Ukrainian infrastructure. They've been trying to destroy the electrical grid and power plants since October, trying to freeze Ukraine for the winter. So this wouldn't be the first kind of crime of this nature, the attack on civilian infrastructure? 
Well, yes and no, because it, it, it's not the first, but it, that the, the scale of this and just the just the myriad consequences that it could cause is uh, unprecedented. The other thing is, uh, this is extremely damaging to Ukrainian land, Ukrainian people, and uh, will the cost of rebuilding it. Um, just the pl- just the dam itself will probably be in the billions, but the damage that it causes. Uh, and the mitigation will be many, many more billions probably in the future. And it makes no sense for Ukraine to like sacrifice this much just to um, flood some of Russia's um, initial defensive lines um, just right on the banks. Um, for Russia, it's um, it could serve as a way to uh, make the Dnipro harder to cross for Ukrainian troops, especially special forces. Maybe they could use their Dnipro grouping of forces to try to strike at a flank of a potential counterattack a Ukraine in Zaporizhia Oblast. And it also gets rid of a crossing point for Ukraine across that part of the river because, um, you know, good crossing points are, are th- there aren't that many of them. There's a half a dozen. So all these things taken into account, it it makes a lot more sense that Russia would do this than Ukraine. You mentioned the strategic considerations and how the destruction of the dam favors Russia on the battlefield. Do you know if that's the reason why it was demolished or do you know anything about the thinking behind it? Well, first of all, we don't know to what extent it favors Russia or not, because um, the, that will have to we'll have to see what happens right. in the coming weeks. Um, but there are couple of reasons why Russia might have done this, either to try to uh, put a, try, try to slow down Ukraine's counteroffensive. Uh, members of the Ukrainian government have uh, advanced this uh, explanation, as has an expert that I spoke to about this. Uh, first of all, it drops a giant problem in the Ukrainian pro- uh, government's lap. Um, it's they have to work hard to mitigate this, possibly using uh, military resources or other kind of resources from the interior ministries, at least. Mm-hmm. To handle this, instead of focusing on the counteroffensive, by getting rid of the crossing point, they maybe hope to slow down and uh, reduce Ukraine's uh, tactical flexibility. Um, so there are reasons why Russia might have done this. Um, they, we've gotten sort of certain noises have been made that the counteroffensive is starting, mm-hmm. and Russia might uh, have, you know, Reacted. intended this exactly. We don't know if this was uh, sort of a panic move by Russia's, but on Russia's part, or if this was a long premeditated move. And what are going to be the consequences of this destruction? There are going to be a lot, as we're seeing now. The uh, humanitarian uh, consequences are dire. Uh, possibly thousands of people are, are trapped, uh, unable to leave. They've been sitting on the rooftops for hours and days. Um, without anything, most of their stuff is underwater. Um, the, the towns were wiped out completely. The the, the river might also pick up um, dangerous chemicals, fuels, um, you know, ammonia. Um, so water pollution. Is yeah, it will pick it up from places where they're stored on land and distribute it over a very wide area and into the Black Sea, which is um, some crazy pollution. The falling reservoir and the, the, the flood waters will reshape the area in um, possibly unpredictable ways. Um, some towns who have, for example, metallurgical industries who need uninterrupted access to water will have to stop those plants. The um, ecological consequences, uh, besides the poisoning that I mentioned before, um, the, this will cause habitat changes, um, Dried areas will be waterlogged, and then uh, conversely, um, areas that were underwater that are sandy bottoms will will, will be exposed, and uh, which might change local weather patterns, reduce precipitation, things like that. And uh, this would wreck agriculture, um, lots of hectares, uh, tens of thousands on the mainland, especially in Crimea, especially North Crimea, because the way it gets its water is from the Dnipro through that uh, through that reservoir. Uh, Ukraine has shut off water, but since capturing the area, Russians managed to um, control it long enough to route the water in and fill up the reservoirs. So they they're saying they have enough, but uh, this might deprive Crimea of a um, stable water source for a long time to come. The other big thing that um, everyone's rightfully pointing to is the nuclear. Uh, uh, threat. 
because uh, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, and it relies on water uh, from the reservoir to uh, as a safeguard to be able to cool itself, cool its um, nuclear fuel. The, uh, the nuclear power plant has its own dedicated cooling pond, and the Inter International Atomic Energy Agency said that it has enough water for its needs for some months, but we don't know what the situation is going to be like. Exactly. Um, without having this water, external water source, uh, it's a huge risk that if something happens to that pond or the plant doesn't have enough water, it could cause a nuclear uh, incident worse than Chernobyl because this plant is much larger. The government said that, what, 600 uh, square kilometers of land were directly impacted by the flooding. Uh, but it sounds like the problems that are getting to from this are much larger and go well beyond that. Oh, yeah. The flooding is just the first uh, first stage of this disaster. Um, it's uh, This is going to affect things for years to come, the economy, the ecology. If something happens to the nuclear plant, God forbid, it's going to last for generations. Um, and it's going to shape the, the battlefields in the coming weeks, possibly. And what has been the response of the international community um, to this catastrophic incident? Well, there were some pretty early condemnations of Russia, you know, pointing that, saying that Russia was, is responsible. Um, from uh, NATO, from the European Commission, the UK foreign minister who was in Ukraine at the, the time, um, he didn't directly say that Russia blew up the dam, but he said Russia is responsible by starting the war. There, there were statements like that. Our colleague Francis Farrell is currently on the ground in Kherson, covering the humanitarian disaster that ensued from the dam destruction. Francis, hi. Hi, Nastya. Good to speak to you. So, Francis, where are you right now? I'm in central Kherson on the main main street, uh, Prospect Ushakova, uh, just a few hundred meters down from where I am is the central square where we saw all those jubilant scenes after the city was liberated back in November. Um, it's quite surreal being back after that, you know, for the first time, it's easy to forget that the city was occupied for so long, but then you see some signs, uh, you, you see the, the remnants of these posters about being together with Russia. Um, you see some graffiti on the wall. Um, but yeah, this part of the city is a lot higher up than the, the low-lying parts. So there's absolutely no flooding danger here, but it's just a few kilometers away where the water begins. I was going to say, we're we're talking on Zoom and I'm seeing absolutely no water behind you. Um, I assume that's not how the situation is like in the rest of the city. Yeah, so... Um, the, the most flooded area is is this uh, district called Karabel Mikrorayon, like district, which is uh, known better as Ostrip or just island. And the areas around it uh, with low density industrial kind of zones. There also water rising in other districts called Shumensky. The water was coming up quickly as well, but at least there, there was there was more accessibility. It was it was possible for uh evacuators to get to mm -hmm. to um where where the water was uh we saw young families being taken out on the shoulders of soldiers who were wearing these uh, big rubber suits so they could just walk in so what does the, the relief effort look like overall um is there a big evacuation process happening are there maybe already local ngos trying to get supplies to people drinking water what does that look like it's i don't want to say chaotic but it's very ad hoc um, so you have different groups at work and, and they're kind of working together. You have, of course, Ukraine's, uh, state emergency services, which are equipped with these amazing, huge all-terrain vehicles with big rubber tires, which can just go straight from the land and start swimming in, in the water, which are very useful. They can't actually come up to the front of people's homes. Um, they're too big and, and, and they don't work like that. So, so otherwise you have you have small boats that's all i saw i just saw small boats constantly going in and out the people in there were some volunteers uh some soldiers honestly mostly just locals with their own boats uh trying to help other basic, people yeah trying to help other people i mean they they were pointing like there's a guy with a boat saying you know this is this is my my apartment there i know all these people here and he's just he's just helping his neighbors get out um but it's also worth worth noting that in areas like Ostrov, you have quite a 
an interesting situation in the sense that you have these multi-story apartment buildings. And so if you're on the third floor or higher, your apartment will probably fine will probably be fine. Uh, these buildings are seem to be relatively stable. There's no sign of of them potentially collapsing, but they will be cut off for a few days. Uh, um, and many of these people have decided to stay. So they're just stuck in the building with water basically like nearly up to their windows on the third floor, right? Sometimes, yeah, yeah. At this point, the water is like coming into a lot of second floor apartments, third floor, mostly fine. Um, but but it's it's a it's a pretty crazy situation. There are some people even in first and second floors who are just staying as long as possible. You know, it's it's almost a similar situation to to people in in Donbass or uh, where there are lots of shellings and people have this stubborn mindset of I'm staying, I'm mm -hmm. staying um, un until the end. A lot of that is because of practical concerns, because they just don't have uh, connections. They don't have necessarily people uh, they can go to. Uh, we met some old people who were just put up in a local hospital for now, but it's not clear where they can go next. Uh, mm -hmm. But at least compared compared to a place like Bakhmut or something, which which has absolutely no future whatsoever and has just been destroyed over the past 10 months, at least here there's a hope that just in a few days... Mm -hmm the water will will go down again and and then they can reassess you know to what extent is is their is their apartment inhabitable at all we were on a call yesterday to plan this interview and i heard sounds of shelling in the background uh, it, it's no surprise to anybody that Hirson is being actively shelled since it's been liberated but there have been reports of russians shelling the area specifically as people were trying to get out did you encounter anything like that yeah, when I was there, uh, you could hear it. It was, it was quite close and it was quite loud. You could hear the outgoing artillery from the other side of the river. And then every time it was a, it was a matter of 10, 15 seconds before you, you heard something arrive. Luckily for me, it wasn't anything uh, too close. I have colleagues who were there yesterday evening and they had a really close call with mortar rounds uh, falling about 100 meters away, which which is pretty close. Um I don't know if this, if something like this has ever happened in, in human history, this, this kind of sequence of events, because I mean, a flood like this, you see the images, people evacuating, people going around boats. That's, that's usually what they call a natural disaster. Right. In this case, it was a deliberate, natural, yeah. man-made natural disaster specifically caused by, by, by one country. And, and maybe... You know, that's happened before. I know in World War II they were bombing dams, but but then immediately afterwards to just start shelling civilian areas after you've caused the flood of these areas. It it, it, I, it I don't know. Like it's 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 hard to be surprised at this point in the war, but it's the level of of evil is just is just something on another level. Yeah. But it seems like people are persevering as always i'm i'm seeing a lot of cars going people walking around you know it, it, it seems like the city the city just looks normal in this one snapshot that i'm getting while zooming with you it looks pretty normal i assume a lot of people don't want to evacuate as always right of course i mean there's a huge difference between your home being threatened by water and 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 not i mean even in the hospital when we spoke to some elderly residents who were evacuated there was a huge difference because on one bed, there was one person whose whose private house was was completely flooded, um, mm. and you know while she's gone, obviously these these are more vulnerable. They're usually built with weaker materials, and so there's a big chance that it it could be collapsed, washed away at that point by the time the water goes down. But the person next to her on the other bed uh, just lived a few floors up in an apartment building, uh, and so she can be pretty confident that probably her apartment will will all be fine the building will be fine um unfortunately she had to leave her cat there because it just climbed mm -hmm. into an impossible corner yeah that that's what i heard we can talk more about the animal situation but but one of the volunteers who was evacuating animals specifically was telling me that while you know there's a a good chance to evacuate most dogs you know if they manage to get to some high ground and make themselves visible it's it's 
basically impossible with cats because they just react differently. They they just become really stressed, and and their reaction is not to look for help. It's just to find a uh, a dark corner somewhere in 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 the house or in the attic and and hide, and and that's that's a, a sure way for them to perish. Well, Francis, thank you so much for talking to us. I really hope you stay safe and come back as soon as possible. Yeah. I'll be fine. Always a pleasure. Thank you. We're not going to be answering some questions that we got from our community members. As we mentioned in the last episode, some exciting news, the Kim Independent finally launched its very own membership system. So you can go to our website, kimindependent.com, and donate to us directly. And you still retain all the same perks as previously on other services that we've used. So you get access to exclusive events like discussions with editors and more. And also you get a chance to ask um, us questions before every single episode of the podcast. So the first question was, does Ukraine have European rescue help? You already kind of touched on it, but maybe we can expand. Besides the money that's been pledged and the supplies, um, like I said, uh, some European countries have promised uh, additional help, but the Ukrainian government uh, would like more. In fact, President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky has uh, heavily criticized both the UN and the Red Cross for not being there and not saving people uh, right now. As far as we know, they're not on the ground, right? Uh, as far as we know, yes. Um, in fact, the, the US State Department said that 20,000 people would need resettlement. And on that note, the other question was, what is happening to the evacuees of both the European-controlled and Russian-occupied areas? I think you mentioned that it's pretty difficult to get out of the occupied areas because the Russians aren't letting people leave, right? Yeah. Uh, Russians set up in uh, not as flooded areas. There are checkpoints. They were actually preventing people from leaving unless those people had a Russian passport that they accepted from them. Uh, they were allowing allowing people with Russian passports to leave, but uh, people with Ukrainian passports were, um, there are many accounts saying that they were uh, held back. Um, in fact, the, the Russians have been blocking volunteers, uh, both Ukrainian volunteers, even Russian volunteers who came to rescue people from Crimea, um, according to these multiple accounts that we saw. Um, in Ukrainian areas, they're um, trying to rescue people. Uh, rescue crews have poured in uh, from all sorts of areas, volunteered. Ukraine has a very strong uh, volunteer tradition, as, right. as you well know. So a lot of people are, are going there right now to do try to help. Um, people are being uh, moved either to shelters or they're finding places with other people. So people are basically being taken to like Mykolaiv Oblast or other areas that are near Kherson but are not as flooded. Yeah, I don't know where they're where they're going, but I'm sure there there are places where they could put them because um, that's been the case with all the internally displaced that I've covered. The third question was: Are there other vulnerable places in Ukraine where the same kind of crimes could happen? If by the same you mean destroy another dam in such a complete manner, I doubt it because um, they would have to conquer the area, go in, set up explosive charges, and then mm -hmm. actually unleash the. They they probably can't do it with with say missiles because a they're probably it would take a lot of missiles to make, even make a much smaller kind of hole, and second of all. Ukraine has had a shoot down rate of Russian missiles lately that was pretty close to 100% in, in many cases. Right. Yeah. Um, but the propagandists on Kremlin's TV channels are talking, of course, about hitting the dam in Kyiv and all of this chaos. That yeah, they, they, yeah they, they need to stoke the, 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 the whole two minute hate thing. Um, that, that's, that's their whole thing. They, they need to sort of uh, take glee in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's doubtful that they can. Uh, actually achieve that. Uh, do repeat this thing, but one disaster of this scale, I think, is enough. Well, Igor, thank you so much for joining us. It was very interesting to listen to you. Thank you. Also this week, Ukraine's military reported that Ukrainian forces were conducting offensive operations and even advancing near Bakhmut, as well as some other areas along the eastern front line. Lviv Oblast Governor Maxim Kozetsky said that the Lviv International Airport may reopen and resume its operations for humanitarian purposes. The airport, like all other airports in the country, has been closed since Russia's full-scale invasion. 
And according to Strategic Industries Minister Alexander Komishin, only 65% of bomb shelters that were audited in Kyiv were technically suitable for use. The audit comes amid severe criticism of Kyiv authorities after three people, including a child, were killed by a Russian missile while trying to access a shelter that was locked. You can find our show on YouTube and all audio platforms every Friday morning. If you like this episode, please subscribe to us and like our content wherever you're listening to this podcast. Please also consider donating to us and joining our membership community by going to our website at coindependent.com and following us on social media at Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'll be back next week. Thank you for watching.